Parrish. Welcome to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me, and for the next hour, we're going to be discussing on CBS Sports Network the 2024 NCAA tournament from every angle, because I, I don't know if you heard, we got a bracket. Unveiled last night, the great Adam Zucker did the honor. 68 teams, a little after 6 o'clock on CBS. That's America's most watched network, network of stars. The number one seeds, UConn in the east, Purdue in the midwest, Houston in the south, and North Carolina got sent out west. So, Norlander, let's start here with the number one seeds. Are you okay with what the committee did? Did they at least get that much right? No, I don't think so. I mean, there's there's two ways to look at this. One... Um, I predicted North Carolina would get the final one seed. I don't, I don't think you had that GP. I predicted it. So I was right, but I don't agree with it. And I know you don't agree with it as well. We might as well stop, start off the top here. Uh, there's no argument that UConn's the number one overall seed. Easy call. Got it done. Uh, then next in line is Houston, which actually jumped Purdue, which had the best. That's kind of, an, you know, doesn't really matter, but Purdue was the number one presumptive number one overall seed for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. And, weeks. and yet Houston winds up in the number two spot overall then Purdue, and then North Carolina. In the overall NCAA tournament seed order, it goes Tennessee as the top two, then Arizona, then Marquette, and then Iowa State. The idea that Iowa State is the worst slotted two seed uh, and, and was closer to the three line than the one line uh, doesn't square with me whatsoever at all. So uh, I don't think it's a crime against humanity, the fact that we've got UNC as, as a one seed here, but Iowa State has just as strong of a case, if not potentially stronger than North Carolina. And I don't understand how the committee, when you took all the votes, pulled them all together and you got that composite, when the seed scrubbed into all of it, that Iowa State would come out eighth overall. I think it actually is a little bit troubling. And as we'll get to later on in the show, it was actually reflective of the fact that this year, for whatever reason, a, a really, really good bubble, a very high cut line. Uh, the committee had a tougher time with seeding than we've seen in a number of years. I'm going to disagree with you slightly. I, I do think it was a crime against humanity. Okay. I, I think it's a crime against cyclone humanity, what the selection committee did to Iowa State. I agree at the tip top, the number one seeds are right and in the right order. UConn should be the number one overall seed. Houston should be the number, uh, the, the second number one seed. Purdue should be the third number one seed. The thing, and we'd established this weeks ago, if not months ago, it didn't really matter what order those three are in because they all geographically wanted to go to different places anyway. So among those three, it, it didn't really matter other than like pride and prestige. Hey, we were slotted ahead of you. But ultimately, yeah. those three all went exactly where we knew they were going to go a week ago and maybe even two or three weeks ago. The interesting thing came with the fourth number one i understand that why north carolina got it i'm not actually surprised that north carolina got it but i do think it's wrong if only because when you are evaluating resumes bodies of work there is no scenario certainly where you can get seven teams ahead of iowa state in the pecking order which is what the selection committee did but i don't really think you should be able to get four the fourth is obviously north carolina let me just run you through some numbers real quick they both have identical overall records, 27 and 7. But Iowa State does have more Quadrant 1 wins than North Carolina and three fewer losses outside of Quadrant 1 than North Carolina. Iowa State, if you care about this stuff, also higher than North Carolina in the net at Kenpa, Mark Torvik. And Iowa State is also the only team in the entire country besides UConn, Houston, Purdue, the three obvious number one seeds to have more than nine quadrant one wins and less than eight total losses. And yet still the Cyclones were made to be the last number two seed by this committee, presumably because of a non-league strength of schedule that ranks in the 300s. I just think that's outrageous. Norlander, we've talked about this at length over the years, and this is a, a fundamental point you and I disagree on, but perhaps we can agree on, on this much of the point. I don't think non-league strength of schedule should be a factor in the selection process or the seeding process at all. You actually don't mind it, but can we agree it shouldn't be used the way it was used against Iowa State because Iowa State's strength of schedule in its entire schedule actually finished top 20 in the country. They actually ended up playing 
according to the metrics, a tougher schedule than North Carolina. But I have no doubt in my mind that among the reasons the selection committee slotted North Carolina as the fourth number one seed and dropped Iowa State all the way down to eighth in the pecking order is because Iowa State's non-league strength of schedule was in the 300s. They, they focus on that instead of looking at the bigger picture. And again, fundamentally, I just think that's an incorrect way to do it. Yeah, uh, the committee fumbled this one. Uh, specific numbers on it. Iowa State's uh, non-con SOS was 324, but its overall strength of schedule was 16. Carolina was 32 overall. Uh, its non-con was 25, like significantly different. So the slope that North Carolina had to face in its non-league was 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 significant. But you know what? In this case here, and, and you're right, like I, I do think it is a it is a net positive for the sport for the selection committee to keep high major programs in check so that we don't have like, you know, what some coaches that didn't get into the tournament uh, were saying, and we'll get into bubble teams more, but they were saying on Sunday night, like, okay, then well, I guess we'll just, we'll just have to schedule a bunch of bad teams and beat them by 30. Good luck and see how that works out for you. Um, that's not what the sport needs. It doesn't need fewer urgent games in November and December. It needs to feel motivated that if we play a tough schedule, frankly, that's why Michigan state shockingly wound up on the nine line. Um, that's why those teams often get rewarded because they ch challenge themselves and their loss total isn't held against them. You know, Iowa state and UNC both 27 and seven records. The average net ranking of North Carolina's losses was 52. Iowa state was 35. I, this this was a miss, and it almost, not almost, it, it very much seems like the fact that Iowa State just destroyed Houston on a level that we did not think was possible uh, enforces all the more that, uh, that, in particular, conference championship performances just, they don't seem to matter a ton. It is only one data point. I get all that. Uh, now, in doing this, and putting Iowa State 8, to circle back to the one-seed conversation, Parrish, I'm looking at this bracket. UConn's the best team. It's the best seed, number one overall, and it's now in the toughest region because it's got the best two uh, unequivocally. Iowa State ranks as a top five team in the country in most predictive metrics. And then not only that, but then the downstream effect is it's got an Illinois team that just won the Big Ten tournament. It's really good. Auburn is a top five team at Ken Palm. Um, so it just shows that there is a trickle down that can sometimes impact the bracket where you don't want to theoretically give the number one overall seed the toughest road to make the final four. That's not how it should work. According to the the... I got the seed list right here. According to the NCAA selection committee, Iowa State's the eighth best team in the in the field or had the eighth best resume. Um, I don't think you'll find anyone outside of that committee room that would agree with that assessment. No, and you're exactly right. We've talked about this for years. When you do something like this, so obviously misseed a team, you're not just messing with their path to a Sweet 16 or an Elite Eight or a Final Four. You're messing with somebody else's path. You didn't just make Iowa State's path harder or different than it should have been. You, you made UConn's path theoretically harder and different than it should have been. And that's not a reward for being the number one overall seed in the bracket. Simply put, I guess I'd bottom line it this way. The selection process should be about rewarding accomplishments, not strategies. Accomplishments. Nobody's non-league strength of schedule should be a part of that discussion, I don't think. If you've clearly put together a body of work that is elite and impressive, why should your non-league strength of schedule matter at all? Iowa State's non-league strength of schedule did not prevent them. This is the most important thing to understand. Whatever it was, and it was in the 300s, I'm not defending it. I'm just explaining it. It didn't prevent them from building a top four body of work in the sport. It just didn't, because that's what they did. So it would be dumb to hold that against them. When your total uh, strength of schedule ends up being in the top 20, and your body of work to anybody who follows this stuff on a daily basis looks like a top four body of work, then your non-league strength of schedule should be irrelevant to any conversation when it comes to where you belong in the bracket. Last thing I'll ask you, then we'll move on. On Dan Hurley, uh, he's yeah. on the other side of this. Is this the type of thing he uses as motivation with this team? Is this the type of thing he places on his shoulder next to all the other chips? Or is he so confident in his team right now? Because here's where I'm at. We can spend 10 minutes talking about how the committee got this wrong. I still think UConn's so much better than everybody else in that region that UConn's still going to be in Arizona with us at the Final Four. But, you know, placing an Iowa State team with these accomplishments in, in the same region as them, I, I don't think it's a... Uh, the, the, I don't think it was the right thing to do, and you could argue it's unfair not only to Iowa State, but also UConn. 
Yeah, if you're watching here on CBS Sports Network, you got a great look at that gorgeous, gorgeous East region and loaded one. But yes, Dan Hurley will use anything and everything, everything to motivate himself, his staff, his players. And he has full confidence that they can go back to back and win a national championship. But he will say, look at this. They want us to play the team we beat in the championship last year in the Sweet 16. They put San Diego State in our way again. They got Auburn, a top 10 team on the top half. We got to play an FAU team that made the final four last season. Then you go to the bottom and Iowa State's not the eighth best team in this tournament and all this stuff. He will absolutely use it and use it uh, to, you know, to his fullest extent. By all means, whatever empowers him and that staff to do so, it will. what it does here is – it, it it brings a level of intrigue with UConn that I didn't think we would have going into Selection Sunday. I didn't think when we got to the bracket, we would have UConn staring down a region that is this tough. And here comes the obvious qualifier. Never. When we look at these things on Selection Sunday and the, and the Monday after, we look at it how we think it will play out. It will not play out. This thing's going to be in flames by dinner time on Thursday. We understand that. but. Uh, it's still more likely than not, and you would agree with me, I know, because we talked about it on the Sunday episode, that UConn has the best chance of having the toughest road to make the Final Four. I think they could. If it if the bracket plays to form, UConn could have the toughest path to the Final Four. I still think most people are going to pick UConn to be in the Final Four because they're not just the number one overall seed. They have been uh, consistently overwhelming for just about everybody since we started this season back in November. When we come back, and we'll continue a conversation about seeding because that is the story of this bracket. Who got in? Who got left out? Eh, the bubble strength, that's difficult. That was a hard job. But the seeding process should not have been this mishandled. It starts with Iowa State, but it's throughout the bracket. We'll run so through some other what we think are mistakes next. It's the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Bracket season is here. Join the madness by playing the official bracket game of the NCAA. Get the CBS Sports app and be part of the madness. Welcome back to the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We are on CBS Sports Network. I am Gary Parrish. I'm joined by Matt Norlander. We're continuing a conversation about the NCAA tournament bracket. It was unveiled on Sunday. And the story of the bracket, Norlander, is we've had a few hours now to digest it, tear through it, seems to be the seeding. I, I think people understand for the most part that the bubble shrunk. Uh, we had five bid stealers, which means five, you know, tables at a, uh, five chairs at a table that otherwise would have been there for somebody to sit in. They weren't there by the time we had to build the bracket. So that's how a, a Seton Hall gets left out and a Indiana State gets left out. And I don't have much interest in debating the, the bottom of the bubble. That was a hard job. I do believe that seeding the bracket should have been easier than this selection committee made it look because there's some things that just pop off the page the moment you look at them. I'll run you through a few. Utah State got an eight seed despite winning a six-bid league outright. That seems horrendously wrong. The Mountain West has two teams in the first four, and New Mexico needed the league's auto bid just to make the bracket. That feels wrong. Florida Atlantic got an eight seed despite finishing second in a two-bid league, couldn't win his conference tournament either, has three losses outside of the first two quadrants, in two, including two quadrant four losses. The idea that you could look at Utah State's body of work and FAU's body of work and say they belong on the same seed line makes no sense whatsoever. Also on the list of things that makes no sense whatsoever, Michigan State got a nine seed despite being five games below 500 in the first two quadrants. Norlander, simple question. Why did the committee, and I say this as respectfully as I can say it, but why did the committee seed this thing so poorly? I think actually the cut line has has some to do with it and the fact that this was one of the best bubbles we've seen uh, in 15 or 20 years. You know, it actually has become a cliche to, to, to hear commentators and pundits say the bubble is just terrible. Sometimes it is. It was not this year. This was an excellent bubble. And when it came down to getting to that cut line and determining what teams were in and out and then trying to seed them, uh, you had a lot of different uh, fortes and drawbacks with a lot of these teams' resumes, but it's inarguable. and 
and even you know uh, you know texting with with someone who was in that selection committee room and part of the process of, of voting teams in uh, late on Sunday, uh, they even passed along. And we even saw this coming from you know the chair Charles Charles McClellan, Dan Gavitt, about how this was the most challenging process that has happened in that room for a long time. And I believe that unfortunately it is reflected in the inconsistencies across the board. And because uh, because the quadrant system is not a perfect system to try and bucket teams and try and tier teams out, I think there are better ways. I think looking at things like strength of record, if you are trying to do stuff with resume for selection and then maybe leaning on just a little bit, not too much, but certainly a dash of predictive stuff with Ken Palm to try and maybe uh, give some credence to teams where they're actually seated, that needs to happen. Uh, my biggest My biggest ones here are FAU as an eight, it's it there's just no case against it or no case for FAU to be on the eight line. Uh, this was a team that some people were actually within an hour of the bracket coming out debating whether it would even make the tournament. Yeah. And it's an eight. OK, Michigan State projected by many as going to Dayton and if not Dayton, narrowly missing Dayton. It winds up as a nine seed as a 19 and 14 team. And if you've watched Michigan State play, certainly uh, I didn't live up to that. Maybe I should be relieved that. Although the eye test should and the discussion about what these teams are should play a part. Virginia's in this field and it, it doesn't deserve to be in the field. Like, I don't think it has the resume to be in the field and certainly has been playing like a team that looks uh, good enough to be in the field. You see the last four in and the first four out here. The Mountain West getting shafted. I mean, the fact that you're sending Boise State and Colorado State to Dayton when they have no business making this trip and going early should not be there. It's a joke. Shouldn't be there. Okay. Utah State is the champ on the eight line is also outrageous. And, the, and New Mexico getting into the tournament only because it won the Mountain West title game. This team is operating as a top 30 team in the sport. I have it in my rankings on CBSSports.com right now. 1 to 68, every team in the field. Guess what? I have New Mexico's top 30. The resume is top 30. Not only did it win the Mountain West championship, if you watch the games on CBS Sports Network and CBS, you saw a team primed. It had previously done enough that maybe get inclusion. Bubble team going in, it left no doubt. It, it, it Getting an 11 is... Uh, is 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 egregious. I mean, it really is. I to me, I'll send it right back to you, GP. I'm looking at this now. Utah State, terrible seed. James Madison as a 12 by the way, is a terrible, a terrible, terrible seed. 31 and 3 team. The two Mountain West teams going to Dayton, FAU on the eight line, MSU on the nine, New Mexico is an eleven. Even Dayton at a seven is too high. Uh, we have given the committee credit in recent seasons on our on our reaction show on on this podcast before. Uh, this is not that year. I, you know, hopefully they do better next year, but they need to evaluate the process just a little bit more. And I'm going to harp on one more thing that I've said in years past. They need to they need to diversify this committee. It can't just be athletic directors and conference commissioners. You need to have a few other people from different backgrounds that really know basketball, love basketball, understand analytics better, so that we can have a better conversation that doesn't lead to, frankly, the national media reacting like this into Monday night before we finally turn our attention to the games. I agree completely, and you could put one of these people in there, and it doesn't have to be me, and it doesn't have to be you, and it doesn't have to be, you know, anybody in oh, particular. Well, hold on. But I'm volunteering. I, I volunteer as tribute. I'm just letting that be known right here and now. That's all. You're volunteering what? I'm volunteering as tribute. Hunger Games. Come on. <laughs> okay. I don't. I don't. It, I. I didn't see it. I didn't okay. see it. Um. I don't know who it needs to be, but some of this stuff is so obvious that if you just had one person who actually looks at this stuff and lives it every single day, then they would just be like, oh, FAU is an eight. That's wrong. You got to, we got to do that again. Utah State and FAU, same seed. That makes no sense whatsoever. You, there is no way you could look at those bodies of work and think they belong on the same line. That is outrageous. No All right. Utah State won a six big league outright. FAU finished second in a two bid league that's ranked ninth in the country. Like, what are we even talking about? So there's some of this stuff that is just obvious and I don't care, like, if I thought you were going to be a three and you got a four, I thought you were going to be a seven and you got a six, whatever. But when I thought you had a, a top 16 body of work and you end up as an eight seed, like, that, that's wrong. And I do think there is something to be said for, I, I'm not here to disparage anybody in particular, but, like, you, met, you said it. These people are largely athletic directors, conference commissioners. They have other things to do. Besides follow college basketball every like I don't really have that much else to do other than follow college basketball from November through April. Like this is my primary job. This is what I look at this stuff every single day. I'm not running an athletic department in addition to talking about basketball. Like I'm not running a conference in addition to, you know, breaking down the Mountain West. I, I do think you're exact. They should diversify 
the, the selection committee and get some people. How about this? You don't even need somebody like me or you or people who follow this stuff every day in the room for every discussion. Just like every once in a while, call me in and say, hey, GP, here's what we're thinking. And I'll go, oh, you got a problem here with Florida Atlantic as an eight seed. That's terrible. Because, listen, I had Florida Atlantic in my top 10, I think top five. It, top five. I apologize. All right. I, I tried I got, to warn you. You don't. You I know you. you just don't I, get it, do you? I got caught. I'm sorry for wanting to believe in fairy tales. Sorry for wanting to believe in fairy tales. Sorry for being a hopeless optimist. That's my reputation. Yeah, that, that's definitely, that's definitely, by the way, that's definitely Gary Parrish, a hopeless optimist. <laughs> Two I'm words that I've been definitely putting together when I talk about GP is hopeless. People, and pe people, people have been saying that. He'll probably be on my tombstone someday. Um, I love Dusty May. I look forward to his introductory press conference at his next job here in a few weeks. Um, but FAU is an eight seed is a joke. They're 10 and five in the first two quadrants. That sounds great because it is, but they only have two quadrant one wins. They have three losses outside of the first two quadrants, including two quadrant four defeats. A number eight seed, just a math thing, equates to top 32 in the country. You can't find a single computer that's going to have Florida Atlantic, not a computer anybody references, in the top 32. 38 strength of record, 39th in the net, 41st at Kempom, 52nd at Torvik. So they don't have many great wins. They have lots of bad losses, and they don't have strong computer numbers. How do you get an eight from that? I'm, I'm not exaggerating, Norlander. If you'd have told me this time yesterday, GP, I can tell you one of these things is true. One of these things is definitely true. you got to tell me which one it is, and you have to bet your life on it. Either Florida Atlantic will be an eight seed or left out of the NCAA tournament. I'd say they're left out of the tournament. And I'd be, it'd be over for me. You'd be and sitting then, here then solo. And tombstone, hopeless optimist, thought Florida Atlantic yeah, you, 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 you Get my tombstone, put hopeless optimist on it. See if, if anybody from Pearl Jam is available tomorrow. And it'd be like a whole new deal. That's how wrong it is to have FAU as an eight. I would have bet my life they're more likely to be out than an eight. Uh, how about this? Uh, Longtime podcast listeners are familiar with uh, with a with a GP term, uh, computer tricker. I'm bringing a new phrase to the lexicon. FAU and Michigan State. You know what they are? It's another three syllable c word. They're committee. Be careful. Be, 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 be careful. Be, be careful. They're committee trickers. Okay. They're committee be trickers. Be careful. We're on TV. <laughs> okay. Committee trickers. That's what they are. Uh, uh, the, the owls and those Spartans. They tricked this committee. They tricked them. Okay. They did. They, didn't trick they did. Computers. The they committee. did not. They didn't trick the computers. They didn't trick most of the people they played, like Florida Gulf Coast and Bryant, or James Madison. But they did trick the committee. Congratulations to them. Let's talk Big East because that's another uh, point of contention, at least among Big East coaches. <laughs> there was a point where that league looked like it could get six or seven bids. It only got three. This is one where I think it's technically wrong because I had St. John's in the field. I would have had four but I wouldn't have had more than four. I think the Big East, as much as any premier conference in America, really got squeezed by the bubble shrinking in advance of Selection Sunday. It did. Here's your, uh, here's your conference by conference breakdown real quick. Big 12 at eight, SEC eight, Big 10 six, Mountain West six, hashtag six bid Mountain West did come to fruition, ACC at five, Pac-12. Uh, if we go a week, five days ago, GP, and, we, and you tell me the Pac-12 is getting more teams into the tournament than the Big East. Are you kidding me? Big East has three, Pac-12 with four. Uh, fewest for the Big East since 93. I, 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 listen, I, I, what I do understand is this. When you compare St. John's versus Providence versus Seton Hall, and you, and you line these resumes up, and you can be in favor for some and not the others. For St. John's, 32 in the net, 71 in KPI, which is a resume-based metric, but 46 in strength of record, and then top 30 in predictive VPI and Ken Palm there. Um, when you look at Seton Hall, 67 in the net, really low down. Strength of record was good, but 66 in KPI. And then in BPI and Ken Palm, it's, it's resume across the board from a metric standpoint was not healthy. And that is why it got held out. The, the one quad three loss really held it back. Seton Hall did beat St. John's twice. And then Providence, you know, it had six quad one wins, but it did not have a single resume metric in the top 40. And that's ultimately what held it out. I thought for the second best league in the country, and that's what the Big East rates at Ken Palm, number two behind the Big 12, um, I thought that it should have had a fourth team in. And I'm not just going to be one of those guys that says this and doesn't give you teams. Get Virginia out of there. And I put, I, th I think I would narrowly have St. John's ahead of Seton Hall. Virginia's out. Seton Hall, uh, Seton Hall's out. St. John's is in. But that's not how it happened. Only three teams in. And now 
yes, the uh, I'm sure the Big East offseason meetings will be uh, quite interesting there. We've got some good quotes already coming out of Kim English and Rick Pitino. I assure you, knowing Shaheen Holloway just a little bit, he didn't take this news. So, so, so with hopeless optimism, I'll tell you that, Shaheen, Shaheen Holloway, not a hopeless optimist here on this Monday. Uh, we'll see how they change scheduling in the offseason. I'm actually a little bit skeptical of that. The one thing here is, of course, the Big East is the only high major league in the country that is what? A double round robin. So actually, it is the one league that, from a conference standpoint, it is all balanced. You play everyone at home. You play everyone on the road. And what you do in non-league play is critical. I would advise these Big East coaches to not think that they can go and schedule and should schedule seven or eight teams that are sub-250 projected going into the season and think that's going to work out for you. In fact, I would advise the exact opposite. Schedule ambitiously. Schedule aggressively so that if you take some losses in league play, you're better set up. And uh, and keep an eye on that moving forward for next season. Only three teams. Yeah, I think, surprise. Yeah, I think that the place where people get mixed up a little bit here and start trying to connect some dots is they'll say things like, how could the second best league in the country only get three bids to the NCAA tournament? And to, to ask that question is to not understand the process in which teams are selected. Because we were talking about the Big East a month ago, and it was like, how many bids? And it's like, it could be seven, could be three. I mean, it really, it was always in this range because they had, you know, at least four of their bubble teams at the very least were, or four of their at-large candidates were always bubble teams. And some like had to, like St. John's had to go on a winning streak just to at least temporarily get on the right side of the bubble. So this was always possible. Um, and it's not an indictment of the league as much as it's just an indictment of you got three really good teams and then you had some other ones that weren't as good. And maybe they were good enough to make the tournament, maybe not. But when the bubble started shrinking, they got pushed out. And it, it should have been four instead of three, from my perspective. I, like you, would have had St. John's in, Virginia out. But it, it's not crazy to me that they only got three. I knew well before, um, you know, the selection show started that it was possible the Big East was, was only going to get three. When we come back, let's turn our attention to that other tournament. Most of the attention falls on the NCAA tournament. But there's some interesting NIT headlines coming out of the weekend nobody wants to play in it anymore is it a real problem is the nit dead we'll get into that next it's the eye on college basketball podcast we're on cbs sports network It's time for the madness. And CBS Sports HQ has your wall-to-wall -wall NCAA tournament coverage. We got your game highlights, expert analysis, and insights all the way to the Final Four. Start and end your March Madness coverage with CBS Sports HQ. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball Podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. I'm Gary Parrish. I'm joined by Matt Norlander. And obviously, most of the attention, most of the attention this time of the year, it's going to be on the NCAA tournament. But there is another tournament. It's called the NIT. And for years, it was considered by most to be a, a nice consolation prize if you couldn't quite get where you were trying to get. Maybe if you won enough games, you could get to the Final Four of that event and come here to New York and play inside Madison Square Garden. Well, Madison Square Garden is no longer a part of the NIT, and so far this year, we've watched Indiana, St. John's, Pitt, Memphis, Ole Miss, and Oklahoma decline invitations to the NIT after missing the NCAA tournament. Norlander, is the NIT dead? You know what? It's not dead, but it is on a path. I'll be quick on this. You know, last fall, there was news that was made and that the NIT was going to change its format to not invite regular season champions that didn't qualify for the NCAA tournament. And because of that, um, because of that, you're losing some of the spirit of the NIT. But now the backfire is you have the high major teams that were given the preference that are now not going. You have a number of teams that are just saying, we're not going to play in it. Here's the thing of why the NIT is in real trouble, unless they change something. And I mean, change it next year. You cannot have the portal close, or I mean, excuse me, open the day after Selection Sunday. You can't have it because what's happening here, as we speak, every two minutes, another guy is going into the transfer portal. Today is the day it opens. The day after Selection Sunday should be a day about complaining about the selection committee, 
uh, griping over teams on the eight line and 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 uh, labeling committee trickers and talking about the games we're most excited about what you got to watch it should not be part of the news cycle that you've got hundreds of players hopping into the portal that aren't a part of NCAA tournament teams. And frankly, talking to a coach who is coaching in this NCAA tournament less than a week ago, um, he was half joking that there was one player on his team that he worried might enter the portal in the middle of the NCAA tournament. The portal date has to move. Put it the Monday after the Elite Eight is done before the Final Four. That is a reasonable compromise i'm not saying we have to wait for the final four to end i understand a lot of team seasons are over but you cannot have this because what's happening is guys are going the portal teams that would go in the nit now have guys that only want to play and it will lead to the death of this tournament if they do not fix this timeline with the portal moving forward starting next year i think they've got a a, a handful of problems here one of them is what you've mentioned um with the portal opening and you every year having to re-recruit your team um recruit out of the portal to replace people you lose um i'm sure there's um responsibilities connected to NIL that coaches are involved in now that they previously didn't have to be involved in. I think in the simplest explanation, there's just better ways for coaches to spend their time right now than playing in a tournament that most fan bases don't care about. Like, um, I guess if you're a mid-major or a low major and once upon a time you made it to the NIT semifinals and got to play a high major in Madison Square Garden on national TV, that meant something. But once you remove New York from the equation, the Garden from the equation, like St. John's had NCAA tournament dreams as recently as 24 hours ago. They don't want to just go play in the NCAA uh, or in, in, in something less than the NCAA tournament um, when there are better ways, broadly speaking, for coaching staffs to now be spending their time. And that's the other issue here is that it's a little bit like football coaches, you know, for a long time now, decades, perhaps um, you know, they play the regular season conference championship games. And then if you were going to make a move, unless you were playing for a national championship, you would leave your current school for your new school before you played in a bowl game. And the reason is because coaches just weighed the pros and cons of staying or leaving now. And it became crystal clear to everybody. My time is better served preparing to succeed at my new job than it is to to continue to coach a bowl game that isn't going to lead to a, a championship in, in, in any way. So I'm going to get on with it. I'll see you guys later. You can have an interim coach for your bowl game. That is more or less what basketball teams are now doing by opting out of the NIT, whether it's uh, Rick Patino or uh, Jeff Capel or Penny Hardaway or Chris Beard. They're, de they're more or less deciding – even if we were to win the NIT, it wouldn't mean anything to us or to our fans. And there's a better use of my time right now. I got to start preparing for next season, not continue to drag out this season. That's where we're at right now, isn't it? Yeah, that is where we're at. And it is a bummer. Like the NIT, uh, you know, it has served as a, as, a, as a nice secondary tournament. Frankly, it's also used to help. Uh, try with rule experimentation that betters college basketball overall. It's actually a, a perfect stage and 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 petri dish for that kind of stuff. And yeah, there's there are concerns about the NIT because uh, it is it is not a huge money maker, obviously. And the fact that you've taken it out of the garden and now you have all these teams turning it down. This is the most high major programs we've ever seen turn down NIT invitations. It, I promise you this: if they do not move the portal date, it will get worse next year. It will. Right. We have what five or six this year. That number might double next year and it uh it obviously dilutes the product that's already an inferior product i mean the NCAA tournament is uh is the greatest event in sports and it already so greatly overshadows the nit but it does have a, i want to be clear on this i think it has a place in this sport and i would prefer it to not go away but if you want to save it you got to move the, the portal open date you have to do it you still might have teams that decide not to play in it i that that horse now might be permanently out of the barn but i actually think you can salvage this and make this the low point instead of worsening it in the years to come Back to the NCAA tournament. Can we talk about some actual games? First four, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then the big bracket starts to unfold Thursday, Friday. We'll get into games next. You're watching the Eye on College Basketball podcast. We're on CBS Sports Network. Welcome back.
back to Ion College Basketball Podcast. We've been yapping for like 45 minutes about this bracket. We barely even touched on games. Can we talk about games, Norlander? First four, Tuesday and Wednesday, then the big bracket starts to unfold on Thursday. I know you've looked at it. I know you've got your entire day planned out. Let's start with Thursday. Give me a couple of games you're interested in on that first big day of the 2024 NCAA tournament. I tell you what. This is this is the podcast on TV because I am editing myself heavily. I'm giving you two. I could give you six, but I'm narrowing it to two on Thursday. We'll go chronological order here. First one, Dayton versus Nevada. That's a 7-10 game. And I think it's got a great chance at being tremendous. It's going to tip off approximately at 430 Eastern on TBS. That's out in Salt Lake City. Uh, really, really good one. The winner of that one will likely, but no guarantee, would play would play Arizona. We want to watch that on TBS. And then another one, let's go to the other side of the bracket here. Gonzaga versus McNeese. We're looking at a 7.25 p.m. Eastern tip on Thursday. That game in Salt Lake City. We've got some, both of my games are taking place in Salt Lake City. That one's on TBS. Gonzaga is a good team. I actually think it doesn't, I think it's not as good as a five seed, but I understand why they're on the five line. McNeese is legit a 31 team coached by Will Wade. They will absolutely bring the pressure. Uh, I don't know, GP, if this is yet a very trendy upset pick, but it's on the board. I'm taking Gonzaga, but I thought long and hard about McNeese in this spot. My favorite game on Thursday, I think, is Kansas Sanford because I don't have any idea what we're getting. Uh, folks who uh, follow the sport closely understand that Kansas has been um, dealing with injuries. Kevin McCuller did not play in the Big 12 tournament. He's their best player. Hunter Dickinson did not play in the Big 12 tournament. So they were down uh, like their two best two guys who combined to average in excess of 36 points per game. Bill Self has said both will play in the NCAA tournament. I believe him, but is it 80%, 90%? Are they 100%? Are they 50%? What's that going to look like? Because we've seen what Kansas looks like when it's dealing with a roster absent uh, Kevin McCuller, absent Hunter Dickinson. It's not great. They've been blown out multiple times in recent weeks. And if they don't have those guys available or don't have them seriously healthy, when you combine it with the idea that they've struggled with depth issues all season long, there's nothing on KU's bench and Sanford plays at a top 15 pace in the country. Then I could see a scenario where Kansas simply doesn't have the quality bodies to get up and down the court um, as much as Sanford's going to try to make them get up and down the court. So I'm interested in that game. Who's going to be available? How are they going to look? And yes, that is a place where if you're looking for a big first round upset, maybe pay attention because Sanford's pace combined with KU's injuries and lack of depth, that's not a great combination for the Jayhawks, I don't think. On Friday, what do you got? What are you looking forward to there? Well, just a quick reminder to our listeners and viewers, uh, Gonzaga McNeese will feed into Kansas Sanford. So we've got a chance that we could have some uh, double digit seeds really threatening there. That could be an awesome site in Salt Lake City. On Friday, I'll give you two. This is on the left side of the bracket. The first one, True TV, Clemson, New Mexico. Uh, Clemson was given no favor here because New Mexico should not be on the 11 line. Clemson's got a great big name, PJ Hall. Uh, this is this has the opportunity to be an awesome watch at about 310 Eastern on Friday on True TV. Uh, New Mexico with Jalen House, who is as good of an interview as anyone in the country and frankly is among the top five must-see players. It's not just offense. He is among the 20 or so, in my opinion, best defenders in the sport. So between him... And Jamal Mashburn Jr. Yes, I said Jamal Mashburn Jr. So a certain section of our podcast audience, we are getting that old. Yes, indeed. Um, very, very fun New Mexico team. And coming to this tournament, absolutely screaming. Cannot wait for that one in a very uh, good Friday afternoon window overall. That's pretty awesome. Uh, in that same window, Auburn, Yale. That'll be about approximately 4.15 p.m. Eastern on TNT. In the top left of your bracket, Auburn the 4, Yale the 13. I've seen Yale play multiple times this season. It is a very talented team. There's a guy named Danny Wolf who right now is wearing, he's wearing like the Batman, Christian Bale Batman mask right now because of a, because of a facial issue, a, a fracture. He is good enough to play for, uh, to start for GP all, but maybe seven or eight teams in this tournament. Like he is a very, very good player, projected potential NBA draft pick, Danny Wolf of Yale. He'll match up with Janai Broom, a very, very good defensive big man. Auburn is deep. Yale is talented. It's got some really good defensive edge to itself as well. The weird thing about this one, this is going to be played in Spokane. 
So you got Auburn from Alabama, and then Yale's got to take the cross-country flight, and they weren't afforded. Now, they're going to get adjusted, don't get me wrong, but this is uh, this is an afternoon tip in general. So I wonder if uh, if the travel impacts them there, but I love those two matchups. On Friday, uh, keep an eye on Wisconsin, James Madison. Wisconsin made the championship game of the Big Ten tournament uh, after really struggling to close the regular season. Three um, and, and uh, eight in its final 11 games before the Big Ten tournament had a really terrible people rating and yet turned it around in the Big Ten tournament, make it to the championship game. And their reward for that is James Madison, a 31-3 and team that opened this season by winning at Michigan State. So James Madison knows what it's like to beat a Big Ten team. It's quite literally how it started this season. That's going to be a fun matchup. Wisconsin-James Madison on Friday. When we come back, one more block to go. We're going to do Final Four. Can't get out of a television show without providing Final Four picks. I know who I got. I think Norlander is still iffy we'll get to that next style on college basketball podcast cbs sports network college basketball podcast i am gary Parrish, joined by matt norlander we've complained about the bracket we've complained about the seating we've discussed the possible death to the nit but we haven't yet given final four picks norlander i i i'm consistent with my final four picks i look at the bracket as soon as i get it i say i'll take this team this team this team and this team and then i stick with it I don't wiggle yeah. around nonstop. I get, I, I gather you're a little, you're a little uh, more indecisive than I. Have yeah. you already changed your final four picks since I talked to you at like one a.m. last night? Yeah, I've wiggled, I've waffled, I've vacillated, and I'll tell you what, I'm feeling hopelessly optimistic about these picks right now. Okay, that's I what they say. That's what that's too. what they say about me. That's what they've always said about me. I, I can't They're be like, that, more that old Gary. That old Gary no Parrish. <laughs> they go Gary Parrish. He's a hopeless optimist. Yes, uh, precisely. You and Larry David. Okay, so I, I will. I'm going to give my first in, in GP. I am not shifting off of UConn to the Final Four, and I am not shifting off Houston to the Final Four. They've been very, very, very good, but I have made some changes. I what? am going to take. I am going to take Saint Mary. I need spice. I need zest in my bracket. I'm going to take five seed Saint Marys with only two losses since mid-December to break through. And I will take Creighton over Purdue. I previously had Arizona out of the West and Purdue out of the Midwest. I cannot live with myself with three ones and a two. Biggest reason why for this is in each of the past 13 NCAA tournaments, there has been at least, at least one team seated fourth or worse to make the final four. And even beyond that and beyond that, a team seated seventh or worse has made the final four nine of the past 10 years. GP, we're going to get this again. I don't think I, I'm ultra confident that I will be right, but I have to take a chance here. I got to pick a team C to fourth or worst to get breakthrough. St. Mary's is my pick in what I think is the weakest region, the region that's most for the taking, and that's the West. So, yeah, why not? Give me the Gales. I'm psyched. Let's go. I do believe the West is the most wide open region, and I guess St. Mary's makes some sense. I just remembered that when St. Mary's won the West Coast Conference Tournament, I told you and everybody else, if you go back to this date and go forward, this has been playing like a top eight team in the country. So if you're looking for somebody that's underseeded that could go far in the bracket, St. Mary's might be your team. And then I forgot. I forgot I said that until you just yeah. brought until you just brought St. Mary's up. So hey, you might be on to something. I've got Baylor coming out of the West. Got them joining UConn, Houston, and Purdue in the final four. You are right. These things almost never play out the way we all think they should play out, the way the previous four months suggested it should play out. That's uh, how March Madness became a thing. But Purdue, Houston, and UConn have so clearly been the three best teams in the country this season. I'm going to trust them to get back to the Final Four and be joined by Baylor. And then I do think Purdue wins the national championship. They go from losing to a 16 seed in 2023 to cutting nets in April in 2024. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry M. F. Teagle, legend. Shouts to Huck. 
Justin Larnell, and thank you guys once again for watching the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We're going to be back 2 o'clock Eastern tomorrow here on CBS Sports Network. Join us then. We'll talk to you. Bye-bye. All right, guys.